Welcome to the Mosaic Radio Theater Live. Today's dramatic episode is a true crime presentation entitled <laughs> Suicide for a Kiss. Our playwright is Robert Timmis. Our sound engineer is Juan Solis. Our musical trio is Keegan Mahan, Nick Kleiner, and Garrett Green. Our voice actors are Robert Timmis as Sheriff Frank Matthews, Craig Showalter as Detective Joe Wilcox, Rebecca Randolph as Mabel Sturgeon, Kat King as Ruth Cadle, Aaron Drake as Prosecutor Harvey, Mario Kreiner as Raymond Cadle, and John Robertson as Coroner Brower. The characters are all real people. These events really happen. Some of the dialogue is imagined for the sake of our radio play, but make no mistake, these events are true, ripped from the headlines, as it were, and they happened 92 years ago, right here, in and around Troy, Ohio. In our last episode of Mosaic Theater Live, Ruth Cato lay unconscious and bleeding on a cot in the Sturgeon home while her husband Raymond hastened into the night. Two days later, we find Joe Wilcox, private detective, seated in his coffee, scanning headlines and sipping coffee. Join us as we present episode two of <laughs> Suicide for a Kiss. Come in, Frank. I've been expecting you. Have a seat. How have you been, pal? Good to see you, Joe. It's been, what, six months? Yeah, seems like yesterday. I met Frank this past February. The infamous Nesbitt case. The bathtub murder. That brutal episode in Troy, Ohio. We worked together three months on that one. Yes, Frank Matthews, deputy sheriff. A good man. I see you've read the papers. Yep. Then you know why I'm here. Yeah, that and a phone call from Prosecutor Harvey. He said you'd fill me in. Joe, I think we've got one eerily similar to the Nesbitt case. Why, it's practically in Nesbitt's backyard. What's with you boys over in Troy? Isn't one internationally known case a year enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, give me the skinny, Frank. Well, Joe, you see this here fella, Raymond Cadle, takes his wife, Ruth, to his sister's house on Rose Avenue, Saturday, early morning. Drops her off and says he's got to go downtown to do some shopping. Takes his sister's kid with him. Drops him off in the square. Doesn't show back up to get his wife until something like 12.15, 12.30, early Sunday morning. They drive off towards his dad's place in Champaign County. Next thing you know, He's showing back up at his sister's house, holding Ruth in his arms. She's knocked out cold, blood coming out of her ear, and won't come to. They call the doc, and Cadle scampers back home to get his mom. You believe that? No. So how'd she really get knocked out? Well, I'm getting to that. When he arrives back on Rose Avenue, by this time, the doc's been there, and she's dead. Okay. I get that, Frank. But why was she bleeding out the ear? Well, he says she fell. Fell? How? Out of the car. Out of the car? Where? Well, on the Urbana Pike. She just fell out of a moving car. How the heck does that happen, pal? Well, Cato claims she was asleep and leaning on the door. Arm hit the latch, door pops open, and out she went. Whereabouts on the pike did she go out? He says on that sharp turn by the McDowell farm. Well, it does sound plausible. How do you figure this is like Nesbitt? Well, that's just the thing. It doesn't stack up. Frank, you're losing me. What doesn't stack? Well, his story. Raymond says she fell out asleep, hit her head on the road, and that was that. But he claims he was going about 45 miles an hour. The road is gravel. She should have been all scratched up, but she wasn't. The coroner said she had a cut on her right heel and two small cuts two and a half inches apart on the crown of her head, and that was it. Well apart from a massive skull fracture. Maybe she hit something. A signpost? Uh, a big rock? 
We went out to the McDowell place, looked everywhere. There's nothing there that she could have smacked into. Both docs who did the autopsy said she would have had to hit something hard, and that with considerable force. Okay. So the cause of the injury is in question. Any witnesses besides Cadle? Well, he says he stopped right away, ran back to her, and then hollered for help. We talked to McDowell. He didn't hear a thing. It was the middle of the night. It was. What else has you so agitated, Frank? Well, the timing is all off. You know us. As soon as we heard of the incident, we were off to the races. We've talked to a lot of people, and what they say doesn't match Cato's story. For example? Well, Cato picked his wife up 12.15, 12.30, shows back up at the Sturgeon's house 45 minutes later, says he drove all the way to McDowell's, everything happened, drove back, tried both the Coleman and McCullough hospitals, couldn't get in, and even stopped at a doc's house, then went back to his sister's house, all in 45 minutes. Sounds like a stretch. I suppose he had it floored the whole way. Well, even if that were true, after he left the Sturgeon house, I'm sorry, that's his sister Mabel's married name. I figured as much. After he left their house to fetch his ma, he stopped at Wyrock's restaurant to wash the blood from his hands and face and get a cup of coffee. (laughs) The doghouse restaurant. Well, that seems a deliberate and casual thing to do. Considering the excitement of that night. Well, more than that. He says he was there about 1.30 in the morning. And the folks who saw and spoke with him insist that he was there sometime around 12.30 to 12.40. That don't stack, Frank. Well, even more. They insist he explained the blood by claiming to have brought an injured girl from Vandalia to Troy in 12 minutes on the Dixie. He swears he didn't say that. He only, that he only said he brought an injured girl to town who'd been in an accident. An injured girl. Did it slip his mind to mention that girl was his wife? Now you're asking the same questions we are. Care for some coffee, Frank? No, thanks. I've already had half a pot already. Well, let me know when you need the bathroom. So, <laughs> so what's old Harvey saying about all this? Well, after interviews, he couldn't order an autopsy soon enough. It's in the coroner's hands right now, but I'm sure he's itching to prosecute. Joe, this guy Cato is acting like a guilty man. Have you told him he's a suspect? Oh, no. We've taken pains to publish that no suspicion is cast on anyone. Well, I'm sure the coroner's inquest will take a little time. That'll buy us room to piece this puzzle together. So you're in. Heck, Frank, I was in before you banged on my door. So I got worked up for nothing? No, sir. You've given me several leads to follow. Well, I'm glad to be of service then. Let's, let's keep this out. Let's keep me out of this for a while, if you don't mind. I'll work behind the scenes and keep you posted on what I find. That was our thinking as well. It'll be our secret. Oh, hey, speaking of secrets, I'm surprised you didn't say anything about being elected sheriff. Congratulations. When are you going to start propping your feet up over in the big office? Well, thanks, Joe. Right now, I'm chief deputy and will be until January. Sheriff Frank Matthews. That's got a nice ring to it. Hey, let's change the subject. You know how I said this case is in Nesbitt's backyard? It literally is. The Sturgeon home sits right back of Nesbitt's. Pretty weird, huh? Two married women, both young, both suffer brutal skull injuries, Both die next door to each other, just nine months apart, and both with husbands whose stories mm, don't stack up. Yeah, that's a coincidence. You know what else? Enlighten me. They're related. Who's related? Nesbitt and Cato. I knew Nesbitt was raised by his uncle after his mom died, but that's it. Well, Jake Nesbitt's uncle, Samuel Hoddle, is brother to Medora Hoddle. So? Well, hear me out. Medora married Albert Widener, and they had a daughter. Uh, What was her name? Delia. Ah. (laughs) Maybe I should write this down, Frank? Well, Delia Widener married Lester Cadle. A name I know at last. Lester is Raymond's brother. That hardly seems significant. Jake Nesbitt's mom, Electa, was 
his sister to Alice, Sam Hoddle's wife, sounds like no bloodlines involved. Maybe not, but two horrible deaths so near the same spot, so near the same time, with men who are at least technically related, what are the odds? What are the odds, indeed? As Frank got up to go, I shook his hand and said, so long, pal. Then I spent the next couple hours wondering, how many more similarities and strange twists would we have to unfold to solve this mystery? Like in the Nesbitt case, would a confession be among them? What will Joe's investigation reveal? Will Detective Joe Wilcox break the case? Tune in next time for the answers to these and other questions on... <laughs> Suicide for a Kiss. Now you almost know the rest of the story.